This is the VIP Podcast, Virginia in Politics. Let's listen to host Chris Saxman explore the personalities and policies that connect the Commonwealth. The VIP Podcast is brought to you by the VCTA, Broadband Association of Virginia and Virginia Free. The views and opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the VCTA and Virginia Free or our sponsors. Well, good morning. This is Chris Saxman on the VIP Podcast. The VIP Podcast is brought to you by VCTA, the Broadband Association of Virginia and Virginia Free, of which I am its executive director. Joining us today on the VIP Podcast is a former VIP. This is the the first time we've had a repeat customer here at the the VIP Podcast. Delegate David Reed, great to have you this morning. So thanks, Chris, for having me back. I didn't realize that I was the first one to like come back again. First of many, we hope. Okay, yeah. I mean, I understand. I mean, you've got 100 people or 140 to go through, so I do appreciate well, we've had uh, we've had a, a great conversation uh, mm-hmm. going on with folks, and we're just blessed that the uh, the Broadband Association could can sponsor this VPM, the studio here, because uh, it's really important to go deeper with uh, policymakers, leaders, uh, candidates for office in some situations, uh, and discuss the issues of the day and get to know them better. And right. and during the course of our conversations and follow ups, we d- discovered. Uh, that we're both fans of Tottenham Hotspur. We, we are both fans of Tottenham Hotspur, and they did not do very well at all yesterday. Or this week. We lost to Man United and uh, and to, um, God, who we lose to yesterday? We lost to Newcastle. Newcastle. Yesterday. They're back in the Premier League. But, but the interesting thing is, is right now, as we get into this run-up towards the World Cup, then it's like, I believe that there's a game every three days. Okay. So it's like, if you like soccer, there's a game every three days between now and and November the 20th. So you can either look at that and go, okay, that's an opportunity for them to correct the losses from the last two, or it's an opportunity to accumulate more losses before going into the World Cup. Right. It's a crazy so let's be schedule. positive. It's a crazy schedule. <laughs> right. And I've I've enjoyed watching the Premier League on NBC and the Peacock stations. Right. And, uh, and the, the broadcasts are fantastic. The, the athleticism is amazing. Uh, Holland with Manchester City is just unreal. It, he is. That guy's yeah. a machine. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it, it is just amazing. It's almost like that he is just so much bigger and faster. Because normally it's like you might have someone who is fast or you might have someone who is big, right. but not both big and fast and able to use his skills to be able to score goals relentlessly. I think now, I mean, we're only 10 or 11 games into the season, and I think he has 17 goals. He's, he's incredible. Right. The he's, next closest, I think, is Harry Kane on our team. Right, right. And he's at nine. Right. He's, when, when you're that much better than the best in the world, that's, that's just jaw-dropping some of those, right. some of those numbers. It's, you, look, you look back at some of the baseball players and the football players, and you go, wow, they're really good. And then you compare them against their peers, you're like, Dag on. These are the right. best in the world, and he's that much better. Well, and that's kind of the same thing that you see or you have seen in the past with Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers. And it appears, I mean, when you listen to sports radio, it's the, one of the common themes that they'll come back is that Father Time is undefeated. And it's starting to look like Tom yes. Brady and Aaron Rodgers are maybe starting to run up against Father Time's undefeated I record. I think less so for Aaron Rodgers because I was watching the game mm-hmm. over the weekend and they showed his uh, changeover in his quarterback's coach, his offensive coordinator, right. his center, and his primary receiver. So he's dealing with an entirely new cast right. of characters. And I, I don't think the Bucks are where they used to be either. But to your point, and let's be honest, Tom Brady's a little bit more distracted this year. <laughs> yes. He's got, his own, he's got his own issues that, you know, can get in the way of his preparation and performance. Just yeah. going to be put it and, out there. And see, at our household, we're, we're both Commanders and Packers fans because my wife's family is originally from Wisconsin, and so they're really very much Packers fans. And me, having lived in the Northern Virginia area for a long time, right. have become you know Redskins and now Commanders fans. And so when they play together, when they play against each other, I have to sit there and quietly kind of go, oh, you know, that was a good play by the Commanders, but I can't be too enthusiastic about it because my wife is then not happy. Right, right, right. We have, we have that tension with the new members of our family who weren't Steeler fans because it was predetermined. Uh, by God, that everyone in my family <laughs> is going to be a Steelers fan. Okay. My, my kids have been raised accordingly. Uh, I, I tell them it's, 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 not, it's not too far off, but it's a joke. And I say, look, we're Catholics. Kids, you can be anything you want. You can be Presbyterian, Baptist, Muslim, Hindu, but you're a Steelers fan. 
That's it. That there, you have, there's no discussion here. <laughs> so now we've not talked about this before. Are you originally from the Pittsburgh area? I was born in Pittsburgh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that yeah. makes sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, both sides of my family are Steeler fans from like the 40s. And, and you were probably growing up during the time when the Steelers were winning Super Bowls with That's, regular yes. occurrence. Yes. But prior to that, the Steelers had been so bad for so long when, when the Steelers made the playoffs for the first time in 72. Mm-hmm. My father cried, and I'd never seen my father cry. And I'm like, why is dad crying? Because the Steelers had been so bad for so long. Now, they were the joke of the NFL. They were, they were just pounded relentlessly by the, by the Cleveland Browns, I mean, which, which were our arch right. rivals. So when the Browns moved to Baltimore, uh, we, hate, we got to hate the Baltimore Ravens twice because they're the old Browns, right? But let's, let's try to get into okay, the yes. politics. We could do this all day long. We love doing it. But we can transition to politics with, of course, the stadium uh, bill that was brought into the General Assembly, controversial, uh, made more so by, uh, by Mr. Snyder. Yes. Uh, what did you think of that? So I have tried to look at each one of those pieces of legislation initially, not as a referendum on Dan Snyder, but rather whether or not it's the right economic development opportunity for Virginia. Right. Because I think as we might have discussed before, it's like over the last couple of years, I was the chair of the Manufacturing Development Commission and I'm still on the Manufacturing Development Commission, but Delegate Byron is now the chair because you know how that works. It's like you sure. transition that occasionally. But something that has been really very passionate for me has been economic development across the Commonwealth. And so I tried to look at it as an economic development opportunity. Now, when the legislation came out, I reviewed it and kind of looking at it from my experience in the business community and experience working in government contracting, I put together 14 amendments and gave it to oh. the to the patrons of the legislation because it's like, okay, if we're going to do this, we need to be sure that we're doing it and it's the best possible deal for Virginia. Right. Now, as time has gone on and things continue to surround the commanders and especially the owners of the commander, I, I think what has ended up happening is that it has become almost impossible to be able to separate whether or not this is a good economic development versus a referendum on Dan Snyder. And so I think as far as myself and all of my colleagues are concerned, this is just not going to happen you know, right now. I don't, I don't, I, that has been the problem all along. And when you look at the deal itself, yeah, it's a big economic opportunity, but it all accrues to Mr. Snyder. It does, and that becomes part of the problem. Now, the other thing that I'd like to point out is that, and this is, I, I'm trying not to be too parochial about this, because again, right ahead. it's politics. In, in, in Loudoun County, so there were three sites, and I don't know if you saw where the I, three sites were. I was were. briefed by Mr. Snyder personally. Okay, so one of the sites is down off of 95. Right. And, and I say this completely tongue in cheek, we never have transportation issues on 95, <laughs> okay? So I, I think that that really was not you know, a, a good idea for that. You don't the, think it was good to put it there? No. The no. Potomac Mills site? No. I, okay. I mean, just think, about, just think about the additional traffic that you're going to put on there. Mm -hmm. The other one was going to be, I think, out near the Potomac River in yes. Prince William. Now, Delegate Torian and I get into kind of a little you know, internal competitiveness about this because, of course, the folks in Prince William County really believe that one or two of those sites are really the best one. But if you really look at it objectively, the site that they were proposing in Loudoun County it's at the confluence of the Dulles Toll Road coming in, oh, yeah. the Greenway going out, yeah. Route 28 going north and mm -hmm. south. It's you know, effectively across the street from Dulles Airport. Yep. And so it made the most sense, I think, from a transportation standpoint okay. of view. Okay. The reason why I was not like overly going to push this for Loudoun County is that area is going to be developed regardless. I mean, yeah. Loudoun County is right. still booming. Right. So regardless of whether or not they decide to go to Loudoun County or Prince William or whatever, I still wanted to be sure that we had the best deal for the Commonwealth. And that was the purpose behind the amendments that I put forward. Okay, so we, I, think we, I think we've covered that. But that site in Loudoun that you're talking about, if everyone's familiar with Northern Virginia, has driven out to Dallas Airport, it's just nor just barely north and west of the CIT building. Yes, exactly. The quarry over there off 606 Route 28. Right. So and for people who don't know the CIT building, as you're going out there, it's the building that looks like a pyramid that's upside down and right. is, is planted in the ground. Somewhat iconic. Yes. To the Dallas Toll region. Yes. Would you know, that's, I think that's yeah, fair to I say. I think that's fair. Over time, it's been it, like... It's an, it's an easy landmark to make reference to. Right. And it's, I think the trees are almost covering it now, it seems like. It's pretty close. Yeah. Pretty yeah. close. Anyway, uh, Delegate Reed, uh, 
we're in the midterms. We're two yes. weeks out tomorrow. Uh, I don't know when we're going to get this onto air, but where do you, where are your thoughts on the the, the country uh, in the midterms? Don't go into races because we don't have to do all that and do the polls and all. But mm -hmm. let's pull up a little bit uh, to a higher level conversation of where we are as a country and our political discourse. If we're talking specifically about the political discourse, it's I, I think that one of the challenges that we have right now as a society and as a country is it seems to be that the, the folks that are on both of the ends seem to be very loud and very vocal and that gets amplified in different ways either by social media or the press because those are the things that will draw viewers. I will tell you that as I go out and I'm knocking doors for Jennifer Wexton and I am going and helping out with other candidates as well, that when you go and you talk to people at their doors and you ask them, what are the things that concern you? What are the mm -hmm. issues that are important to you? You find that the great majority of the people are really kind of somewhere in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And they're talking about the kitchen table pocketbook issues that they're concerned with. And they want to know what we're doing to be able to address those things. And that's been one of the kind of guiding principles of my time that I've been in. Because I, if you think about the three things that I ran on when I first got elected, it was college affordability, because I'm the first person in my family to ever get a college degree. It's the cost of tolls on the toll road, because mm -hmm. again, some of my constituents pay $500 a month in tolls. And at the time, Loudoun County was one of only three jurisdictions that did not have full day kindergarten. And so it's like all of those things affect people's livelihoods. And if you can go to people's doors and talk to them about things that you're doing that are going to benefit them and benefit their children, then I think it has a much more positive impact. And I think you get a much more realistic view right. of what the, the electorate is thinking. It, why did you run? What was, what was the impetus? What, what said, David, run for the House of Delegates? I, when I was thinking about running for office, I had spent, uh, l let me back up in time. So when I was 10 years old, I was living in a four-room cinder block house with an outhouse. Hmm. Fast forward to when I was a junior in college. Oh, this is in the Shenandoah Valley, Rockbridge County? This is in Rockbridge County. Okay. So, and, and when I tell people this story, they're like, okay, are you talking about you or are you talking about your right. parents? Right, right, right. Are you talking about like the 20th century or right. the 18th your, century? Your life. Right. No, right. It, it's my life. And right. so I was living in a four-room cinder block house with an outhouse. And then through a series of circumstances and some help along the way, when I was a junior in college, on the cusp of becoming the first person ever to, in my family to get a college degree, it's like, okay, I'm living the American dream and I felt like I owed something back to the country. And at that particular point in time, I started looking at the possibility of, while I was still in school, of joining the Army. And that didn't kind of work out well. But then I graduated in 84 and then in 88, I actually was able to get accepted into the Navy reserve program. And so that began the process of me giving back. So I think throughout my life, there's kind of been this desire for service and to be able to give back. And I think combine that with growing up in the mountains where it's like problem solving is something that is just kind of ingrained in your personality. Yep. You put those two things together. And I would tell people when I was running it, it it's like, I like solving problems, and, and don't you think that there's a lot of problems we need to address at the mm -hmm. state level? Mm -hmm. And so you put those things together, and I think that was really what created the impetus for me to want to be able to run and, and hopefully make a positive difference. Sure, because sure. That, that's one of the things that I key on when I talk to people, because you can come down to Richmond and you can not do positive things. But I think if we always have as a goal, it's like, are we doing things to make things positively better for people's lives. And I think that's a good yardstick to use. And I think in, in rural Virginia, especially, well, rural America, rural life, mountain life, that's where I'm from as well. So mm -hmm. it was my district uh, just north in Augusta County, Highland, right. Highland County. Okay. Um, the people there, um, when you live a rural existence, you have to help each other out instinctively. And you don't, and a lot of um, um, people who get, get by on their own. Right. right? Self-starters, you know proud, hardworking people. Mm -hmm. 
but they're also at, at the drop of a hat will do anything right. for you. And this is not a knock on suburban people. Is that this, they're not from the area. They don't. Right. They're not connected innately right. by going to the same church and going to the same stores and seeing each other uh, in the schools. And the, the sense of community is sort of is a is a is an ethos. Well, it, it really is. I mean, and to one of the things that you're talking about is like when. Because I still have relatives in Rockbridge County and right. still visit the area. And one of the things that I've been doing as part of the Manufacturing Development Commission is I've been traveling around to places in the Valley and Southside. Because one of the things that from a business perspective, VEDP, the Virginia Economic Development Program, does a really great job of being able to attract new businesses. But I had asked them, I said, so who's talking to businesses about business retention? Mm -hmm. Because if the first time we hear that a business is moving to Alabama is when we see the press release, then it's too late. So one of the things that I made as kind of the remit when I was the chair was to go and visit these manufacturers and let them know that we're interested and we're appreciative for them being here. But as you travel around, whether it's south side, southwest, or in the valley, there is this thinking where it's like, I don't want a handout, but I want a helping hand. Right. And so we just have to kind of think about that from a policy standpoint of view. And we're even seeing it now where we have made, we as the General Assembly have made some substantial investments in rural broadband. I mean, to the tune of north of $800 million. And right now, I think we're probably a national leader in that. And when you talk to the people that are rolling that out, it is a life-changing event for them. It Broadband is the rural electrification of the previous century. No, no, without question, without question. Um, so coming from that background and uh, saying I'm going to run for the House of Delegates, were you involved politically? Were you... Were you did you do the stuff at the local level that, that people said, oh, yeah, we know, David, or did you just say, you know, I'm going to run for the House of Delegates, you know, political party be damned, and here I am. So, so that's a really good question because, prior, so, so my wife and I have now lived in, in Loudoun County for 22 years. Prior to that, I lived in Alexandria, which is really very Democratic. And I was actually involved in the Alexandria Democratic Committee okay. as the precinct operations chair for the West End. So I was very much involved and then moved out to Loudoun County and wasn't in, involved initially because at the time that we moved out there, we're in a new house. I, I think that I might have like just changed jobs or was on the verge of changing jobs. The girls were very young and so you get involved with soccer and karate and sure. ice skating and all of those other type of things. But then I did get involved later. So yes, I, I was somewhat of a known quantity. As a matter of fact, when and I had helped out on campaigns. So in 2016, when the caucus was looking for people to, to run, then there were a couple people. One was Liz Miller, who had run against Tag Greason two times before right, and right, lost. Right. She, no kidding, lives around the corner from me. And Joy Maloney, who had run for school board, and I was on, I had helped her with her election for school board, she was also around the corner from me. So there's like something in the water, okay? <laughs> they had, I guess somebody had reached out to them and they had said, well, you might want to talk to David Reed because he's been involved in the community, he's in the right. military, you know, he you know, meets these different right. kind of check marks, and they reached out to me. And that was, you know, that with kind of my desire for, service and being able to want to be able to address problem solving. When you, when you came in at a, at a historic election. Oh, yes. 2017, massive Democratic wave. Uh, 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 I wouldn't say a repudiation of Donald Trump in Virginia, but certainly a reaction to his presidency. Or would you say repudiation? I, I would have to say reaction. Okay. To, I, I mean, I... But that, I, that was a significant part of the Democratic victories in 2017. Oh yeah, very very much so. I mean, there are times when I will talk to people and it, it, they, they will ask me, so what was it that made you be successful? And I will tell them donors. I ended up calling 10,000 people. What? 10,000. You made 10,000 10, individual calls. phone calls for donors. Yeah. I knocked on 8,000 wow. doors myself. Wow. And then those economic issues that we talked about, but that along with having the kind of reaction to Donald Trump, I think is what helped to propel me to victory, but also got us really very close. Did you have a nomination contest? There was not a primary. No kidding. There was not a primary. Wow, that's impressive. 
Yeah. Well, I think one of the things was is that when the caucus had called me, it was in 2016. And think about it, in 2016, we're still operating under the assumption that Hillary is going to be the first female president. Oh, okay, so it was it was it was back before the, the election. Before the election. Yeah. Okay. That's wow. when I, that's when I first started looking and thinking about it. So I did not run as a reaction to Donald Trump. I ran because I thought that it was the right time and the right possibility for me to be able to contribute. Because it's a significant amount of time. It is. It is. 10,000 phone calls and 8,000 doors takes a very long time. Oh, it does. I mean, I was working full time 40 hours a week and I was campaigning 40 hours a week as well. And then I remember my campaign manager had said, okay, you need to take time off from work so that you can like finish out the campaign. And I said, okay, when? She goes, well, can you take off in June? It's like, I can't take off in June. I still have like a mortgage and all of these other type of things to pay. So finally it ended up being September and silly me, I thought, oh, maybe I'll go from doing 40 hours a week of campaigning to maybe 60 and I'll be able to help my wife out around the house with different things because she had been doing it. No, it went from 40 to 80 hours a week of doing nothing but campaigning. But again, that's one of those things where it's like, if you are passionate about what you do, and if you enjoy what you do, then it never really seems like work. And that's the reason why with this job as delegate, I tell people it's the very best job I've ever had. <laughs> and people are like, are you, know, are you crazy? There's always people that wanna say bad things about you. You have to run every two years. But just go back to the very basics. It's like, I like to be able to talk to people. I like to listen to their concerns. I like to hear when the system is not working well for them. And then you've been here. It's like coming down to Richmond Mm -hmm. and being able to actually solve problems for them. And if you can get the legislation introduced and passed and it gets, you know, goes into effect on July the 1st, I mean, I could be talking to a constituent now that has a problem and the problem could potentially be fixed by July the 1st. I mean, that's really very rewarding. You you can make phone calls and get stuff done in this. Oh, yeah. And and it feels really good. But you do it so often. It's like, of course, it's what I do. Right. I, my mother called me up one day and said, uh, I just had an encounter with a lady at Kohl's and she looked at my credit card when I swiped the card and she said, your son saved my son's life. And she called me and she said, I'm so proud of you. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. She goes, apparently you called something DM. I said, DMS? She said, yeah, it was for her mm-hmm. kid's medicine. And you got the kid her medicine, his medicine. And I was like, yeah, I do that all the time, mom. And, and, and let me give you- You do it all the time. You, you do, but, but it's like if you're doing the job for the right reason, exactly. then you don't really think about that because no. you're doing it for the right no. reason. And I'll give you another example. In my community back in March, there was a house fire that then spread to three other houses, complete total loss. and really very sadly, one, one person lost their life during it. But then the, the folks as they're starting to try to rebuild are having a little bit of trouble. They're following the processes with Washington Gas to be able to get certification mm. that the gas has been turned off at the tap so that they can begin kind of the, the, the removal of the debris and mm. the renovation and everything. Course, course. So they reached out to me and because of the relationships that I've developed down here, I reached out to Scott McGeary and <laughs> Scott with, with Hold on. Scott McGeary is one of the best people on the planet. I call him Scott McGoogle because he's so knowledgeable of Virginia politics. Go but, ahead. But, but I, I, I give a shout out to Scott because I know he listens to all but, of our so, podcasts. So you know, but, but it's like I, I, I reached out to Scott and again, because we've developed a relationship over the five years he's a great guy. And, and it's a great relationship within 12 hours. Yeah. These folks had gotten the certification letter that said that it's been turned off and that the the, the removal of the debris could proceed. Right. And those are the types of things that actually have a direct impact on people's lives. Because if you think about it, they, they, they've all lost their houses. They're living in temporary housing. Mm. They're having to adjust to everything. They're having to buy new clothes, mm-hmm. new cell phones, get right. rental furniture, and all of this other type of stuff. So if it's something that me or you in the past could do to make that a little bit easier for them, then that's the reason why you do the job. And, and that's what I think um, gets people out of the negative political discourse that, that I began the part of that conversation about. It's like, you know, you're not, you're not the guy out lobbing bombs. You're not the guy who's you know, taking on the other party or picking fights within his own, you're, 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 to me, and what I've heard throughout the, the building, if you will, and, and from other folks, is that you, you, you plow ahead, you get your job done, you do it uh, amicably, uh, small, uh, song in your heart and a smile on your face, and you just, you just carry on. 
Um, it, it sort of brings me to my next question, uh, and you're not going to answer this, so don't start. Um, you know, my first, the night, and I'll pre preface it by saying this, this uh, offering this story. The night I was elected, 2001, this is just okay. less, this is less than two months after 9-11. Wow. So on stage with the wife and the kids, you know, at the big event, you know, we won and we uh, we won the uh, Mark Warner won. Tim Kaine won that night, mm -hmm. uh, governor, lieutenant governor. But Republicans had a very large majority in the House at the same time. Can you imagine that dynamic today? Doesn't happen. Right. So I get up off the stage. I go down to the bar to get a drink. The first question I'm asked, literally the first conversation I have, what are you running for next? Here's the kicker. It was my parish priest. <laughs> right? You're like, what? <laughs> it, it never dawned on me right. that I would be considered for another race. Right. I never thought about state Senate, U.S. Senate, Congress, whatever. I mean, it was totally out of my mind because you're grinding so hard in the campaign. Right. But then it starts putting, being put upon you. Right. Now. And I is, isn't that somewhat humbling, though? That it's people stupid. It's <laughs> <but, but people, laughs> like, what? <laughs> but people think enough of you. Yeah. To be able to kind of project that. And that was one of the problems I had is people would say, oh, you're running for lieutenant governor or you're running for Senate. And they, they would start moving me in that direction. Like, this is what you, he's got to be doing this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this has been the farthest thing from my mind. Right. I'm exhausted. <clears throat> I just want to go to work. I ran for the House Delegates to be a delegate. So, so, so let me tell you a funny story. Um, so p people do do this because, well, first of all, let me back up and say that when I first got elected and... I, my, my minor claim to fame in that class of 2017 is I won by the largest margin of victory of anybody who was running against an incumbent Republican. I got almost 59% of the vote. Massive. And it, I mean, even if you attribute a large portion of that to Trump being at the top of the ticket, oh, well. okay, there was still the hard work that had to, that, it, that had to happen to make it possible and the message and, and other sure. things. But I remember at... Now, my, my victory party was just at a local place, okay? I wasn't at a big event like you were or anything like that. No, this, this was back home. Oh, okay, it was back this home. This is home. And, this is and, like, you know, 100, 200 people in a yeah, row. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I remember saying to people then that it's like, okay, yes, we got 59% of the vote because it was a collective effort, but I do not believe that Ashburn has become Arlington or Alexandria. We can't assume that that means that those were all Democrats. I believe that I got both Democrat... Republican and independent votes. And I believe that I have tried to govern that way over the last five years. Well, and the reason I bring this up is because I've heard your name mentioned as a possible statewide candidate. Say nothing, do nothing, but your smile says a lot. Um, um, and, and in my observation, the Democratic Party, having Done in Virginia politics for 30 years. Wow. You, I, this, my first race, and I write, I'm like 20, 26 at the time. I was a volunteer. So I, I was a I was, late starter because I didn't no, like but I was on Bob Goodlast's campaign. But I, but I didn't get started. I didn't get elected until I was 55. So yeah, well, Okay. <laughs> but you're youthful 55. So I mean, I was a, I was a, I was a, a school teacher and I volunteered on Bob Goodlast's campaign. Mm -hmm. Just to help put a debate together because I was right. a history and government teacher. I thought it was kind of mm -hmm. fun got asked to run, cha, 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 one thing led to another. And I talked about having these other offices put upon you when, you, right. when you're like just blown away that you're in the House of Delegates. Right. You're walking through Jefferson's living museum here right. and you're just in awe. But I, 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 my observation of the Democratic Party and why they've been so successful at the statewide level is that they have nominated relatively moderate in tone, if nothing mm -hmm. else, uh, inoffensive, uh, productive, um, competent people who can go around the state and not go, oh, he's one of those. I mean, he's, like, he's a nice guy. And that's all I hear about you. He's right. a nice guy. And, it's, and, and nice goes a long way in this business. Yeah. Popular, you know, being popular is still the number one goal in getting elected, right? And you still have to be more popular than your opponents. Right. So my question to you is, if there is a statewide opportunity for you, let me not do that. What do you see the, the, the future of the Democratic Party in Virginia to be? Is it aligned with the National Democratic Party? Because I don't think it is. I don't think Virginia Democrats are that far left or moving that far left that quickly. I think one of the things that we've really kind of come to recognize, and, and I think that this was partly an outgrowth from 2021. I mean, we had a really good run of having 12 years of electing statewide offices uh, in, in Virginia. 
And then I think, and this is, this is of course, is in no way a reflection on the, the candidates who ran, but I think sometimes there were like external influences that probably influenced the campaign. Mm-hmm. And Great. I think also that there's probably, and I think both parties do this, where you think, okay, Virginia is more red or Virginia is more blue than it really is. Because I think Virginia still sits at this kind of crossroads of the mid-Atlantic and the southern area. I think it's still very much a very pragmatic group of people. Mm -hmm. Going back to the conversation that we had earlier, when I go out and I talk to people and I ask them what is their concerns, it's usually somewhere in this middle frame Mm -hmm. as far as what are the things that they're concerned with. And again, as I mentioned, it's like I've been going around the state because it's like I'm on the Broadband Advisory Council, I'm on the Manufacturing Development Commission, and I'm on Appropriations. And you know, we, we put money out, and it's like I'd and like. For, and for the limited amount of time you've been down here, relatively speaking, to be in those capacities, especially on appropriations, is extraordinary. I, I it, appreciate you would take it. It would take at least a decade, right, back in the day, uh, in, in in my class to be on appropriations. It just yeah. didn't happen. And, and and I appreciate that, and I appreciate that former speaker Fillercorn gave me the opportunity. And then current speaker Gilbert chose to leave me on there. And I remember having a discussion with him. He's like, if it's working, he goes, I don't feel that it's necessary to change it. So I guess, right. you know, because I do on appropriations, I, I am known to ask tough questions and to ask detailed questions because, again, we have a fiduciary responsibility for $165 billion. Mm-hmm. And so we need to know how it's being spent and whether or not it's being spent well. And this is one of those things is as I go around, whether it's in broadband advisory or manufacturing appropriations, I ask these questions. It's like, what are we doing well and what could we do better? Right. Because those really are ways to open up the conversation. And then people will be honest with you and they will tell you, this is what you're doing well. Like with broadband, it's like, we are a leader in the nation on this. And then they might transition and go, but we can't lose sight of the fact that we're still going to have holes in coverage. So the money that we've put in now is gonna get us to a certain point, but we have to be willing to make a long-term commitment to it. And this goes to the thing that I've said about the budget. The budget is both about priorities and a vision for Virginia's future. And that vision part is the part of the things that we're investing in. So there are certain things we have to do today. We have to pay teachers, we have to pay law enforcement, we have to do those type of things. But then investments in broadband, investments in reducing, you know, making college more affordable, those type of things, workforce development, we won't see the results of those immediately. But if we put in place those things and then five years from now, we have broadband all across Southside, and now people are choosing to move to Southside because they have high-speed internet and they can do their job from anywhere, right. then that's a good thing for the economy of Southside, and it's good for Virginia as a whole. Since you've been mentioned in the context of a statewide run, um, and we're well off in the, in the future, and you wouldn't, it, right. it, it would not be calendar smart <laughs> to, to put that flag in the sand just yet. However, if we're looking ahead and going into the future, and we talk about political discourse and Mm -hmm. um, the machinations of the Virginia budget and what has to happen in Virginia, and you mentioned vision, Mm -hmm. what would David Reed's vision be for Virginia in the next decade? So my vision for what we could be in the future is really very much kind of reflected in the legislation and the budget amendments that I've already been introducing. And and let's just look, I mean, because sometimes we lose sight of things. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So we have an issue where we have across the Commonwealth, and it it, it doesn't matter which industry you're talking about, and the new kind of term of the day that we all use in everything is supply chain, okay? Well, in every industry that we have across the Commonwealth, we have a personnel supply chain issue. So let me just give you an example with nurses. We have 16 really great nursing schools in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but we don't have enough nurses to actually be at the hospitals taking care of you or your children when you show up there, or at a doctor's, or taking care of your senior loved ones at an assisted living facility, because there's just a shortage of them. So how do we fix that problem? 
And in talking to the nursing schools, what we have is we don't pay our nursing faculty, our adjunct faculty enough. So I'm having discussions. As a matter of fact, when I go back home today, I'm having a discussion with UVA, who is a school of nursing. I had a discussion last week with JMU to like figure out what's the right number for the budget amendment. And so we need to be able to fund that sufficiently so that we can have more people teaching. And that doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether or not you're talking about welders or machinists or anything. We don't have enough of the subject matter experts teaching people to be the next generation of whatever. So I think a, a vision for the future would be that we look at these things individually and say, how do we address each one of these problems? I think the other thing is, again, going back to the, you know, the thing that I have been working on since my first, my first race is this whole issue of college affordability. You may or may not know this, but it's like when the Pell Grant was originally made available, it was for $6,000 and tuition was about $8,000. Mm -hmm. The Pell Grant amount has not changed. Tuition and going to our most affordable school now is somewhere around $25,000. And for me, again, it was a life-changing event for me to be able to go to college. It then opened up the door for me to go into the Navy. It opened up the door for all kinds of other jobs. And we have so many people across the Commonwealth who never have the discussion about even going to college because they just can't afford it and it's just not discussed in their household. So we have to address kind of the workforce development issues. We've got to address college affordability. We need to be able to continue to address economic development. And I think, again, Manufacturing Development Commission. We have been anemic in our funding of business-ready sites as compared to our peer competitor states. And we have some really outstanding sites that are at the tier four level, not tier five in Berry Hill and in Greenville. Right. But if we're not willing to make the investment in those, and remember going back to that vision and the investment for the future, mm -hmm. if we're not willing to make the investments in those, then we won't have the opportunity to land Hyundai or Tesla or right. Rivian or the next Ford plant, right. whatever it is. And when you visit those areas, that would be 5,800 jobs, one of those plants, oh, 5,800 yeah. jobs. Massive capital investment. Billions of dollars of capital investment it would be more substantial impact on the economy of Southside than having Amazon put their headquarters to in Arlington. That, that, that changed the dynamic. So, but, but, it, but it's about priorities. I understand it's about that. making I understand that, that commitment. And you, and you have a lot on your plate. Yes. And you, you, you went down uh, a rabbit hole of, uh, for, for the average voter, minutia. Yes. But that's where the, but that's where the battles are law, uh, uh, fought and won every day in this building. Yeah. What is that? Put that on a bumper sticker for the average voter. What would David Reed's bumper sticker be for the future of Virginia? Oh, bup, bup, bup. I, I, I have no idea what that would be because I don't even have like a bumper sticker slogan for my current stuff. It's just <laughs> read for delegates. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, but, but like if you had to put all of what you're doing. Right. I mean, these are tweaks into a very large state government that is fairly right. well run. Oh, yeah. Fairly well funded. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the economic engine of the Commonwealth in your backyard, uh, Northern Virginia. Yes. That's the federal government churning out federal contracts. Do you know how large the Virginia economy is? It's massive. <laughs> $548 billion. It's comparable it's in size to Poland or Sweden. It's, it's we, amazing. We, we need to think about ourselves as a mid-sized European country and act. Without a team yet. Just kidding. Without <laughs> <laughs> a professional team. Um, and we got the port. You know, oh yes. Yeah, we have we have great assets, and we are so close to a, a money printing machine in the federal government. Mm -hmm. But that fiscal reality is going to hit the fence one of these days. It's going it's, it's going to hit full stop. We just can't keep going into debt for the for the future of this country. Yeah, I mean, we, there has to be a time we go. Hey, folks, we have to pay for this stuff. We're running a trillion and a half dollars right now. If if the um, if the Biden college affordability new plan right. goes through where we're uh, um, canceling student debt or uh, forgiving it, um, uh, strike that balance. Because yeah. when we had, went through sequester sequestration. And I was working as a contractor when that happened. So you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and Northern Virginia, Crystal City hollowed out. 
I mean, it was a devastating impact in Northern Virginia. And, and that's the reason why it always is so perplexing to me, because you know it, okay, and I know it, but when you have candidates who are running for federal office in the Northern Virginia area that will say, I'm willing to shut down the federal government. It's like, do you no, understand <laughs> what you're doing? What's well, when mean, Ted Cruz shut down the government and uh, during 2013, you know, Ken Kuchelan is like, seriously, Ted? Right. I'm running for governor right now. You, and Ted's trying to make his run for, for president. Kuchelan is going, hey, knock it off. You know? it, it has, there, I know of business people who were Republicans up until that point. They had a small 35 person business mm -hmm. that did work in the intelligence community. They didn't have a lot of like excess cash to carry them mm -hmm. through or whatever. And when it was done, they said, I'm not a Republican anymore. I'm an independent. This is completely irresponsible. And I guess that's getting back to that political discourse because we have significant problems. And, and I, um, I moderated the debate between uh, Elaine Laurie and Jen Kickens last week, two weeks ago. And I laid out all of the, the, the fiscal realities this country mm -hmm. faces. You know, f and, and, uh, in 2032, we'll be $45 trillion in debt. Mm -hmm. We're running a trillion dollar deficit. We've got Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, which are not state issues. No, no. But they're going to be impacting the, the forward growth of this country, which then impacts the budget and all the investments you were talking about. You can't make those investments if you're, <laughs> if you're not running a positive book, right? Right. And that's where I think this political discourse really has to get shaped up or we're, we're in, we can't, this is unsustainable. Would you say, so is this sustainable? Our so so let's go back to the political discourse discussion because I think that's kind of where we're going. And I think it's driven by the individual and recognizing, again, when, when I went home after the 2018 session, my very first session, people would say, what were the lessons that you learned while you were in Richmond? The number one thing that I tell people is you got to be able to do basic math. Because 50, <laughs> 51 is still greater than 49 and everything else rolls downhill from there. Yeah, that's okay. The, the speaker at the time, Three Kirk Cox. every day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the speaker, Kirk Cox at the time, I mean, and you, know, it, it, you, you needed to get at least two Republicans to support whatever you're doing. I mean, and I knew that from the time that I spent working in business development, mm -hmm. it's about relationships. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did when I got down here is I went and introduced to myself then Delegate Ben Klein, who represented the area of Rockbridge County, home, and said, I was born and raised here. Yeah. I then went and introduced myself to Terry Austin, who represents the area where my mom was from, from Botetot. And Chris Collins at the time, because I went to school up at Randolph Macon Academy oh, for okay. a couple years. Sure, he sure, represented sure. that. And Matt Ferris and Les Adams, who represented the area down in Alta Vista in Pennsylvania County, where my dad lived at the time. And Glenn Davis, who represented the area where I had done reserve duty with the Navy down in the Tidewater area, because I wanted to be able to develop relationships so that I could maybe get at least two Republican right. votes Give me two. to get something <laughs> done. And the other thing that I would tell people is that, and again, this is about the political discourse stuff. We've got to be just a little bit empathetic. The issues that we have in Northern Virginia are not the same issues that you have in the Valley, Southwest or Southside or, or any other place mm -hmm. around this. Mm -hmm. And we need to be empathetic to what their concerns are. And by going and talking to people, they can be empathetic and then go, wait a minute, what? Your constituents pay $500 a month in tolls? You could like buy a nice car for that. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. they could. And so it is a two-way street. Right, right. And it's one of those things where it's like, we have to be able to recognize this difference in diversity across the Commonwealth and be able to talk to people and then I think that provides us with a way forward because then people will trust you. They will know that you're an honest broker mm -hmm. and that you will stand by your word. And I think that those things are so very important. It's so very important. 20 years ago, 20 to almost 20, I'm just dumb. I know when 20, you start thinking about uh, 20, 2001 and now it's 2022. It's, it's, but back then <laughs> we came out of a time that fiscal, auster, not austerity, but fiscal responsibility was because of Ross Pro in 92. Mm -hmm. he, changed, he changed the entire dynamic of that election. I say he won the debate, but this didn't win the presidency. Right. He won the debate because both political parties said, we have to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. We have to pay off our deficit, uh, pay off our deficit, pay down the deficit and pay down the debt. He won the debate. And both parties 
went after his vote because he got 19% right. of the vote. Yeah. No small, no small amount. And at amount. the time, we really didn't have the global competition that we have today in the mm -hmm. 90s. Right. And that really funded a lot of our growth and a lot of uh, American dynamism right. following the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Our generation is in a different place. Yeah. Right. We're coming into this. OK, it's been 20 years since I've been in, in, in directly involved in politics. And I look at, you know, and 9-11 had a huge impact on that mm -hmm. because we put that we put those wars on the credit card mm -hmm. and justified it as such. Very much so. And that funded a lot of growth in Northern Virginia. I'm not going to go through it all. But we have to get back to that. Is this sustainable, this current path that we're on? We understand the reaction to 9-11. I don't think we understood how deeply those rever reverberations were. Right. Um, seismic. But if we don't get back on a, on a fiscal uh, sane plane, and, and, and that's and what, how do we draw that balance and go, look, guys, it's, we can, you can't pay for your grandparents' Medicare if we don't do something here or the kids' future. So, so that's one of those things where it's really very nice that the Virginia Constitution requires a balanced budget. Thank God. Okay. So, so therefore, we have to live within our means. And because we do not have the ability to print money, then that again means going back to that earlier part of the discussion, we have to make priority decisions about the budget right. and then figure out what those investments are for the future. And it's constantly a, a balancing act. I will tell you that one of the things that I have often said when I am mentoring candidates who are thinking about running for office, and I will ask them, I will tell them, so what are the top three things that you think are important to the people in your district? And invariably, they will start to skew towards national level things because right. that's what you hear a All lot about. Okay, All so you're running for school board. You're not going to have an impact. Right. on. So it, it's like I will try to get them refocused because one of the things that the Navy teaches you really very well is about respecting the lanes and the road. And so one of the things that I try to do is I try to stay focused very laser on what it is that we can do within Virginia and what we can do at the state government level. And I have a really great working relationship with Jennifer Wexton and their office so that when issues come up, especially constituent issues, we refer them to them. And when we have issues that come up that are board of supervisors or school board issues, we refer them to them. So it's like while I recognize and I appreciate the discussion about the federal debt and the deficit right. and everything like that, I'm going to leave that for the folks that are at the federal level. It's a very wise move when you're running for state <laughs> office, but uh, I'm sure we'll, 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 uh, we'll trespass on that issue uh, another time. But one area that does impact state budget, and you know this very well in, in Virginia, is Medicaid and Medicaid eligibility. Yes. Um, and with the pandemic ending, we might see a, a lot of people no longer eligible for Medicaid after the expansion from uh, the pandemic, the, the emergency. Um, how is that going to impact the state budget, and, and what is the responsible path forward for those uh, on Medicaid in Virginia? With Medicaid expansion, initially, of course, when it was rolled out, we thought that it was going to only benefit about 400,000 people. Now it's somewhere north of 600,000 people. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is really very telling because it tells you that there's a large number of people who need health care and who were not getting it. And, and, I, and just for our audience, who are poor yes. by definition. This yes. Is, this, is, this is health insurance for poor people. And, and I'll give you an example. And, and also for our audience, Medicaid goes up every year. It expands every year. <laughs> so it's so, like the people. So, so no, but, but I'll give you a couple of examples where it's like, this is something where we have to make a long-term commitment to our people, okay? So first of all, I get up every morning and I read the news for about an hour from different sources because it's still the intel officer in me where sure, it's like, sure. I want to be able to look at different things, see what the sources are, kind of compare and contrast them and then be able to draw my own conclusions. But I remember reading at one point in time about a free clinic that was closing in Danville. And you think, oh, that's a bad thing because the free clinic is closing. Well, it's not a bad thing because now that Medicaid expansion oh. has existed, those folks can go to their own primary care physician. They don't have to go to a free clinic anymore. Now they can get recurring care and be able to have preventive medicine as opposed to just going to the free clinic or going to the emergency room when they have a crisis. So that's one that was really big. And then keep in mind that me growing up poor in the mountains of Virginia, 
when I went to the Methodist Children's Home in Richmond, it was, I mean, I needed glasses. I didn't know that I need glasses because we didn't have the money to go. Right. My sister was 16 at the time, and I don't think she had been to the dentist in 16 years. Wow. And so when we first went to the Methodist Children's Home, they wanted to pull all of her teeth and give a 16-year-old dentures. What? Fortunately, they got a second opinion, and she still has her teeth, and it's taken a lot of care along to the way. To this day, she still has her teeth. She still has her teeth. That's fantastic. But, but, but it's, it's those are personal, lived experiences. An example that inform somebody. your opinions of all. Yes. And, so, you, and, and, so we have these extra people on Medicaid. That's a difficult conversation, not because you don't want to have people on Medicaid for their personal health, which you just described. Right. But the budgetary impact is going to be significant potentially to K through 12. And, and, and again, we go back to the question about what are our priorities? Right. We're going to have to make priority decisions. And, and I will tell you that when I first got put on appropriations and I got the budget. I read through all 601 pages. I did it, you know, in I think small. Think you need hobby. I, just, I, just put I, I did it in <laughs> small bits of 10 or 25 pages. I think at I would time. rather drive a 10 penny nail through my knee. Than but it's like that. I wanted to know what I was getting into, and I wanted to be able to do a good job. Right. And it then helps to inform my decision making along sure. the way. Things where I did not know the answers, I can go and ask the experts and go, I saw this in there, can you explain this to me? Mm -hmm. And it, it's so amazing that when you actually take an interest in people's work, whether it's people's work within the state government or a manufacturing facility in Whitfield or something else, they want to talk about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And if you listen and you're a good listener and you ask questions, you can learn a lot along the way from people. And that's going to be a difficult conversation for the, for the Commonwealth. Fair to say going forward. Is it, is it not? I mean, I, we're going to, we're, the impact of the pandemic, uh, we were blessed to get through it. You know, I don't think it was our finest hour as a country per se, politically, both sides politicized mm -hmm. the pandemic, but injected with a lot of money, a lot of programs. And like 9-11, you know, this is, this is sloshing around. It's like, okay, where's this going to settle out to, right? And this is going to be a very, very difficult conversation for folks in the building going forward, don't you think? Right. And, that's, and, and again, that's the reason why we get elected. We get elected to be elected leaders and to make those difficult decisions. Right. And again, I think the way to go about doing that is to look at all of the information and then make the very best possible decision that you can. That has held me in good stead for the last five years and for the last 30 some odd years in the business community because I've worked in several different industries. So banking and training and business development and counterterrorism and global telecommunications. I've always known where to go to talk to the experts to find out what are the right best decisions. But then again, the, the Navy teaches you a lot of things along the way. And one of the things that they teach you is that at some point, because you are the officer, you have to make the decision. And the people have elected us to be elected leaders. So we have to take all of this information and then be willing to make the tough decisions. And then the people will decide, for me, every two years, whether or not they like the decisions I'm making. And if not, then move on. <laughs> <laughs> And so we must today as well. But I think your sunny disposition, your willingness to work as hard as you have, uh, is a reason why so many people think so highly of you. I appreciate and are, that. And are, and are suggesting, if nothing else, that there might be another office in your future. And, and I have to tell you that it's like, I really do enjoy the job. I've always told my girls, do the very best job at whatever you're doing, and the future will take care of itself. Very true. And I also believe one of those kind of golden rules where it's like, treat people the way you want to be treated. And, and that goes a long way. And so, yes, I have Democratic colleagues and Republican colleagues. I have friends on both sides. And I, I just want to be treated the same way. I want them to give due consideration to my legislation, regardless of whether I'm a Democrat or Republican. And I am a Democrat, so it's mostly the it Republicans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> well, that, I mean, your, your, your story is, a, is a, a, a compelling one. I think it informs, it's obviously informed who you are and what you do. But, you know, I think your, uh, your, your, your persona, your, your, I don't know, it's, a, it's a weird way to say this. Just, you, you, have a, you always have a smile on your face. And it's like you grew up in these hard circumstances. And yet you have, you know, when did that, when did that, did that always, were you always that kid? Just, you just didn't know you were poor? Like, I mean, I'm sure you did so, at some so, point. So that's really very, because I did not know that I was poor initially. I didn't know I was poor until fourth grade. And I got called to the principal's office. Have you ever been called to the principal's office? Not for being poor. But no, no, no. But have you ever been called to the principal's <laughs> office? I don't want to answer <laughs> Come this. Come on, fess up. Okay. So I get, times. <laughs> okay. So I get called to the principal's office in the fourth grade. And when you get called to the principal's office, just like when you get called to the speaker's office, and I'm not saying that that ever happened to me either, but it did, mm. you're automatically thinking, oh my gosh, what have I done? Oh, yeah. Okay. You get called to the commanding officer's office. Right. It's like, oh my gosh, you right, know, right, what have right, I done? Right. So I get called to the principal's office and I'm thinking about all the things that I know that I've done that morning. Again, living in the mountains, Rockbridge County, we had a rock fight at the bus stop throwing rocks at each other. Smart. Then we got on the bus and continued to fight. Then there was probably something I did when I got to school. So all of this is going through your mind. Right, right. I get up there and there's a counter and there's a box on the counter and the lady there says, we've collected clothes for the poor, ch poor children, so here's your box of clothes. No, you were told you were poor. I was told I was poor be by the school system. No one would ever do that now, okay? But that's how I found out. And people will ask you, it's like, so what did you think about that? I was excited I got new clothes. <laughs> It's like that story of the kid, uh, the pony at Christmas, <laughs> you know, where's the pony? But, but again, we, we lived in a four room cinder block house, not, not four bedrooms, four rooms. Oh, I got it. So my dad and my three brothers all slept in one room. Mm. My sister slept in another room. We heated it with a wood stove. There was an outhouse. We got our water delivered by a truck in a cistern. Mm -hmm. The people across the gravel road were in a single wide trailer. The folks across the hill were in a double wide trailer, so they yep. were doing well. That was uptown. Right, and then the other folks had a single wide trailer. Yeah. This is, this is how I grew up. We didn't have money for a bicycle. We would take our stuff to, we would get in the tractor and take our stuff to the landfill and then pick up other people's old beaten up bicycles and bring them back and put together That's our problem. own bicycle. You made do. Yeah, I mean. Still had fun doing it. We, we, Ate a lot of fried bologna sandwiches and pinto beans and oatmeal. And didn't didn't think, go hungry. Didn't think otherwise, right? No. Yeah. Didn't well, know I was poor until fourth grade. Delegate, it's it's always a pleasure to talk to you, even when we're chatting on a phone or shooting yeah, texts. Yeah. I, 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 I always smile when I'm because you're always smiling. It's infectious and it's long overdue and much needed in our political discourse. And uh, I wish you the very best in the future and hope well, you'll come back you. on. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be back. We'll be, we'll be texting over the weekend with the Spurs this weekend. And uh, we'll, we'll so there's a game on Wednesday. Oh, that's right. Against Indeed. Sporting Lis Lisbon. Oh, we're because we're in the uh, Champions League. The Champions League, right? Yeah. Right. So I forgot about that one. Anyway, great to have you on the VIP podcast brought to you by VCTA, the Broadband Association of Virginia. Speaking of broadband, Virginia Free, of which I am executive director. These podcasts are available to you on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. Please subscribe, like, and share. Thanks so much for joining us, Delegate David Reed. Thank you for having me. Great to have you.